Good evening. I welcome you this evening to our Good Friday service. This is a time where we are at the end of our Holy Week, the end of the Lenten season. We come with misgivings, we come with concerns, yet we come this day with the opportunity to see hope in Easter. I invite you this time, if you will, to open up your bulletins to the quiet meditation that's printed inside. These words are from an author unknown. It reads this way. Bathe the world in your mercy, dear Lord. Cover us with your grace and draw us to new life through your death. I love you, dear Lord. I love you with all my heart. Jesus, I trust in you. As I pause to reflect on these words before we begin to meditate, I am drawn to the words that I so often hear, words that come at a question. The words are these, God does not give us more than we can handle, right? Over and over, I hear those words. I wonder if it's a quiz. I wonder if it's tribulation. I wonder where that comes from. I remember hearing that as a boy. A teenager, a young adult, and now. God does not give us more than we can handle. As I pause and pray about that, I think to myself, is it God that gives us, or does the world give us? Do we accept the fact that we have free will? And if we do, that invites others into that same category. Humanity has free will. Therefore, it's not what God gives us, it's what the world gives us. Which leads to the question, does the world just give us all that we can handle? And the answer is absolutely not. The world gives us so much more than we can handle. It happens in moments. It happens in seasons. It happens, it seems, in lifetimes. The world is giving me more than I can handle. response, Christ gives back. You see, in the world giving us more than we can handle, we are demanded to have faith. Faith is what carries us when we can't do it alone. Faith is what restores us. Faith is what lifts us up when we think we cannot do the next thing. So the question is, has the world given me more than I can handle? And to that I can respond, yes. But I can also say that Christ gives you enough to get through, enough to get by, enough not to simply survive, but to thrive through faith, through hope, through tears, and through love. Tonight, I ask you, during this time of quiet meditation, to become aware of the times by which the world has given you too much, given me too much, given us too much, more than we have the skills, the strategies, the techniques to handle. And to answer with, I know that the world offers big problems. But I have a bigger God. And that as I stand in the midst of this world, let me say again, over and over, regardless of the author, because it does not matter, God, bathe the world in your mercy. Cover us with your grace and draw us to new life through your death. I love you, dear Lord. I love you with all my heart. 
Jesus in this moment and in all moments. I trust in you. Slowly we come to worship on this holy Friday. Reluctantly we hear the story of Jesus' suffering. Bleakly we follow Jesus to the cross. Humbly we acknowledge our heart in his passion. Deeply we yearn to understand the depth of his sacrifice. Solemnly we gather this day to bring worship together, giving thanks for our Savior Jesus Christ. Please join us, join me in singing our uh, hymnal, number 369, Blessed Assurance.
day and holy are you, O God. Thank you for the sanctity of this day. Let us know the name of the special challenge. If there will be a drink for us to drink, turn it back to wine. Sweeten our trouble. Be close and be right to the But don't let us let it stop or forget us. Wake us up to the struggle of everyday life. Let us remember the best day to day in our lives. The day we first found you. Each time we come together, we pause for a moment of silent confession and prayer. Aware that confession gives us the opportunity to pause and move back into relationship with Christ. This time is where we talk about those places by which we have missed the mark. We have felt anger and resentment. We have felt in a sense of disconnection with ourselves and with God. In addition, others have sinned against us, causing us to feel as if we are no longer interconnected in community and in communion. Confession is an opportunity to share those thoughts, those expressions, those prayers with the loving God, to be aware of the good news, to recognize that what we hold in our hearts is open to freedom simply by restoring our relationship through confession with God. And so I ask you to pray silently with God this time. The good news is this. Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem sinners. Hear it and believe it. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you please rise as you're able and join me in hymn number 288. Were you there? Number 288.
Please listen for a word from God as we read from the Holy Scriptures. Tonight's reading is from Psalm 21, 1 through 8. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am alone and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the world in whom he delights. Tonight's Gospel reading is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18, verse 1 through chapter 19, verse 42. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with the lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them, and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. 
I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's, head, Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did the others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, 
You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, Have I written? I have, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear, tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures said. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. <coughs> Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first of the other two, of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of the scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. 
They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had been laid before. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let us pray. May the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. At the very beginning of our Gospel reading today, we hear of soldiers and police officers, those with not only power and authority of position, but also armed and prepared to do violence. And when they come upon Jesus, they say that they are searching for Jesus of Nazareth. And he who stands before them, dirty and dusty, in an old and tired robe, wearing shoes that were probably falling apart, unarmed, unprepared for any kind of violence, says these simple words, I am he. These words hang in the air for so long that they knock the very authority out of those who have come to capture him, claim him, arrest him, and kill him. I am he. The magnitude of these words, I pray this day, do not fall upon ears that do not understand them completely. I am he. For a narrative of capture and arrest, a narrative of torture, a narrative of injustice, we hear only one person stand up as they are and say, I am he. The irony, I pray, is not lost in these words. No, every single person who comes across Jesus is unable to honestly, truthfully, and with any authenticity, be themselves. Pilate, who is a Roman governor, sways by the crowd. He never says that I am the governor, I make the decisions. There is something to be said that he sits in the judgment seat, but chooses not to be the judge. He says, not once, I am the judge. I am the authority. I am the power. Instead, he hides. He skirts about and can't even understand the truth. people who we hear about in this story are unable to be truthful. They are unable to be themselves. They are unable to be authentic and real. They are fully immersed in sin. They are fully immersed in this experience that they can no longer own themselves. They have no place before God. They have no place in the leadership. They have no place in the roles of community. They constantly hide behind some unknown power. They never say that we are the law enforcement, the police, the authorities from the temple or the synagogue that demand that things change with Jesus. Instead, they travel in the dark. They travel in fear, afraid. Afraid of what? They've got the weapons. They are afraid that someone will know who they truly are. 
when Jesus stands before them this day, he says, I am he. And he challenges us to say the same. Good Friday is this opportunity to truly be yourself. To say with total frankness that this is who I am. That I stand up and want folks to be aware of my brokenness, of my sadness, of my, the times by which I've done the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, acted in the wrong way. The times in which I've done things that I am being shamed by the world. In being yourself. In being the person who says, I am he or I am she. I no longer have to trust that other people's opinions, other people's authority, other people's representations of a script I am to follow is the truth. My truth, the truth, is one that is filled by following a Savior who stands up to everything and everyone. Jesus does not have to sit in some judgment seat. He does not have to say that he is a king. He does not have to say that he is a leader, a governor, the person who is the high priest. He does not need any title because in and of himself he is Authentic. He, as they say, is the real deal. And the message of Good Friday, what is good about it, in one way, is that you can be the real you too. For all that you are trying to hide from the world, the Lord says, be you, and I've got you. He walks to uh, Calvary, aware that as he carries that cross, he says your name and your name and my name. And he does not turn away. He does not go to the left or to the right. No, he goes straight on through. And he rides that cross, that tree. And for those who knew his culture, it was a horrible thing. That is why Peter is so angry. That is why Peter is so against the fact that this could be the Messiah. Because this is not how it's supposed to end. Paul goes out of his way to try to keep down and destroy the followers of Christ. Because of the cultural knowledge that crucifixion was an abomination. Jesus' response is, I am he. Not afraid, not ashamed, not resentful, not in sin, but in the glory of knowing what was going to happen, says simply, I am he. And as he walks that road, as he walks to Golgotha, with each and every name of every existing human being before, during, and after on his lips and on his heart and on his soul. He says, I love you. I love you. And I love you. Won't you just be you? Good Friday opens the door for us to be ourselves. Good Friday opens the door to say, I don't need purple. I faded to black on what it used to be, and I am prepared that in a few days there will be light and there will be glory. And God, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will cover me. I will be dressed in God's glory. We see that in baptism. We say that you are dressed in the glory of God. We say that as you are covered in the water of baptism. 
In contemporary language, young people say that when you are clothed in something, you are dripping in it. We are dripping in glory and stand unaware. Jesus calls to us from the cross surrounded by people that said, if you could save everybody, save yourself, says, I'm saving everybody by staying exactly where I am. And when we kneel before that cross, when we come to our place of prayer, where things are going bad, when the world points its finger at us, when we are canceled and forgotten, and told that we are wrong, we come and kneel and pray, and the Lord says to you, you are dripping in me, and nothing can harm you. There will be those who will accuse us of all things. They will accuse us in all places. They will find fault. They will find reasons to devalue you. They will come for us in the dark because they're already afraid of the potential within us. And we, we can only have stand before you because I stand before the Lord and am restored. I stand before you and I look in my mirror. I see what you see and I am not intimidated. I stand before you in the world aware of the dangers that you think you have in your hands. I say, Friday has anything for us. It's the good of being safe in a beloved Christ. It is good in being free to be yourself. It is good for the chance that in only being honest before God, in confession, in restoration, in resurrection, So we should take these next few days. Take tonight to look in the mirror and see who you really are. See that there's nothing that you can do or say to make God love you any less. To allow the veil that separates what's holy and unholy to be ripped open. To see that the battered and naked Christ on the cross is accessible to you when you are most yourself. And in a world that asks for sacrifice, that asks for wounds and butchery and death, we have Christ, a God willing to spill blood for us. The crucifixion reverses everything the world will ever tell you. It takes away our old fears. It washes away those that we those things that we think keep us from God. We step forward, as Isaiah says, white as the lamb. Jesus emptied himself for us. He emptied everything for our restoration. This day, may we empty everything that we hide behind so that we may walk in the glory of Christ, restored and renewed, and knowing above all anything else that I am.
Would you pray with me? Loving God, we step into the darkness of Good Friday with the fears that everybody else has because they are real. We don't know what lies on the other side of Saturday. And so we put our hope in you. We put our faith in you. We put our trust in you. And you answer. You answer with Easter. You answer with resurrection. You answer with renewal. You answer with light. Help us to follow your light through the darkest tunnels, through the deepest waters, through the most dangerous fears. Because on the other side, and yet deep within, is the golden grace of your love. And so let us join those who have trusted and believed those who have followed and secured, those who stand amongst Christ in the eternal kingdom as saints, and pray as they pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would like for you to join me in Holy Communion. Um, do we have that in, their, um, in the hymnals? Right, so if you open up to page 12 in your hymnals, or is it on the back? It's in the hymnals. 12. Page 12. And so the invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Earlier today, during the service, we confessed our sins and heard the pardon. And so I invite you at this time to turn to page 13 and join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you come together in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He said to his disciples, Take, drink, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you come together in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, in one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. This is not the Methodist table nor the Sussex table. This is the Lord's table. All are welcome to participate. We have multiple uh, choices. The first is uh, gluten, uh, wafers, and juice. We have single serve with both the, uh, the wafer and the, the juice inside. And we also have gluten free. So if it's Regular communion, just please give me this, okay? If it's single serve, right, like this, right, right, and then give me this for the gluten, so I know there's three different things that you can have to take, okay? I don't think we need ushers. I think that you can come forward orderly and uh, celebrate your time.
Would you please rise for our final hymn? Our final hymn is found in the Faith We Sing, which is this thin uh, paper kind of book. It's number 2112, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley, 2112. <laughs>
thank you. You have a beautiful one. Yeah. Stay safe. Is his phone still on? Uh, no, the the fastest yeah. phone? Yeah. Or is yeah. it? Oh, yeah. I can turn it off. Yeah. Tim, is, this, is your phone still on? Oh, here? yeah. We got it. Just, I think it's just, is there like a finish or something on there? Oh, I can't see. But I was ready yeah. to turn, I want to turn it off. On here. Thank you so much. You, uh, you want me to leave the lights on while you change? or? Oh, that'd be great. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Instead of.